I wonder if I could tell a story or two about Sidlow Baxter. When I was 16 years of age, my father gave me a set of books. They were individual volumes. I think they're in one volume now, but they were called Explore the Book. And while he said, you know, you have to be careful about all the details and test it by scripture, yet it was a tremendous help to me to get an overview of the Bible, and I highly recommended it. It was the first series of books I really plowed through seriously and found them extremely helpful. And then uh, when we took a trip to Scotland to visit family, I discovered that my cousin lived in the home that had formerly belonged to Sidlow Baxter when he was the uh, preacher at Charlotte Chapel in Edinburgh, following uh, Graham Scroge. And so uh, I was given this copy of a Heart Awake. His book, Awake My Heart, is famous, and this is his biography written by E. A. Johnson called A Heart Awake, and it has some interesting little stories in it. I'll just mention one or two and then tell you what's really on my heart. He was raised in a Christian home. As a little boy, they left Australia and came to England, and uh, he was a bit of a rebel in his early days and wasn't really interested much in the gospel. When he was 16, uh, his mother gave him a Bible and wrote in the front of it the scripture that Mary gave to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Uh, later on, when he was married, his mother gave him another Bible. And in it, uh, she said to them, well, you're married now, all your troubles are over. <laughs> but uh, she wrote in that, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Well, when he was a young man in England, there was uh, two brothers, the Wood brothers, and they had started this Young Life campaign in which they were traveling from place to place, having gospel meetings in various locations. And on this occasion, they were preaching in the Midlands at a, a theater. Every day, the title would be put out of that evening's message. And on this particular occasion, the topic was the infallible detective. And so... Sidlow Baxter found that quite curious, thought, yeah, I'm going to go along and listen. And uh, sure enough, Fred would preach that night and had a very challenging message, but his verse was, be sure your sin will find you out. That's the infallible detective. And sure enough, the Spirit of God got a hold of him that night, and he put his trust in the Savior. A lot of uh, amazing stories about the man, but I would just want to focus on one sermon that he preached that was uh, very powerfully given, and it was on the delays of Christ. And the first delay, of course, in John six seventeen, was it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. The story of sending his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. He had gone up into the mountain to pray. And the false assumption they had that if they couldn't see him, he couldn't see them. But he knew exactly what was going on. And in the storm, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus appeared. But he seemed to have delayed his time in coming. And the question was, why? And then later on, how the Lord Jesus was delayed in going to the house of Jairus. My daughter is at the point of death, he said. And as Jesus made his way through the throng, he felt the woman touch him. He pauses, he brings the woman forward, he spends time talking to the crowd and reintroducing this woman who had been unclean, ceremonially unclean because of the issue of blood, and gave her an opportunity to confess her faith. And by the time they get to the street, the folks come out and say, don't bother him anymore, it's too late. Uh, she's, she's gone. And the Lord Jesus said, well, she's just sleeping. They laughed him to scorn. 
But going into the room, of course, he took the child's hand, Talitha Kumi, raised her from the dead. And then, of course, the story of Lazarus and how, if only you'd been here, right? He delayed two more days in coming. And so the questions are, why Why would he do this? And, of course, uh, Baxter has some excellent points to make about uh, the Lord developing faith in our hearts, developing confidence in him, realizing that there is no situation that is impossible to him. Death, shmeth, right? He can conquer death. He can conquer storms. He can conquer whatever it is. And the fact is that while we may think he's delayed according to our schedule, as far as God is concerned, he was always right on time. There's a lovely poem at the end of this little section, and I'll just read a stanza or two to you. Ungranted yet the prayer your lips have pleaded in agony of heart these many years, does faith begin to fail, is hope departing, and think you all in vain your falling tears? Say not the Father has not heard your prayers. Full answer there shall be, sometime, somewhere. Ungranted yet, though when you first presented this one petition to the Father's throne, it seemed you could not wait the time of asking. So urgent was your heart to make it known. Though years have passed, pray on, do not despair. Such prayer must answered be, sometime, somewhere. Ungranted yet? Nay, do not say unanswered. Perhaps your part is not yet wholly done. The work began when first your prayer was uttered, and God will finish what he has begun. If you still keep the incense burning there, his answer you shall see sometime, somewhere. Ungranted yet, faith cannot be unanswered. Her feet are firmly planted on the rock. Amid the wildest storm she stands undaunted, nor quails amid the loudest thunder shock. She moves omnipotence to hear her prayer and cries, it shall be done sometime, somewhere. Now, what makes this especially poignant, one of his most famous messages, is that he only had one daughter. He and his dear wife had one daughter. I think she was about five years old when they moved to Edinburgh. And they watched as she slipped, as she grew, slipped farther and farther away from them and, f and from the gospel. And eventually, she completely cut off her father. Her mother had died and for the last four years of his life, he pined over his daughter. She never even gave him a call, never sent him a card. He actually tried to hire someone to go and find her, and they couldn't. And she's just disappeared into the mists of time. Were all their prayers unanswered? You see, this is uh, what faith is really about, isn't it? That when sight argues with me, argues with my faith. I say, wait a minute. I'm not saying that if I pray enough times, Lord, save them, Lord, save them, Lord, save them, that somehow by my oft-repeated prayers, he'll do it. He might say, what exactly did you want me to do? Christ died for them. He's provided salvation. My spirit has been working in their hearts. What would you like me to do? And this is where we can pray. Lord, bring godly people into their lives that they'll admire, right where they are. Lord, stir up the memories of the father's house like the prodigal. Happy thoughts of home sitting around the table. Lord, resurrect the truth in their hearts. Sunday school choruses, memory verses, like Richard Dawkins singing a hymn in the shower. Lord, make them feel filthy in their sin. Don't give them peace until they find it in the Lord Jesus. We can pray practical prayers because we know God has promised to do these things. Do you think you love your child more than God does? Do you think you have more invested in them than he does? 
Do you think you want to see them save more than he does? Yet he lets them have their way. And yet in wonderful workings, he hems them in. He surrounds them with a divine conspiracy. I was talking with a dear brother at breakfast this morning and saying, listen, the books will be opened at the judgment seat. And one of the reasons they will be open is so that God's people can see how absolutely thorough God was in doing the work. How many choices, how many options, how many opportunities, how many kindnesses the Lord showed them to woo them and to win them. And so we don't know what will happen to all of our children and grandchildren, but we do know this. If they perish, it will not be because they were unloved by heaven. It will not be because they were unsought, that they were untouched, that they were unenlightened. The light has shone in upon them. So let's keep praying. Let's not give up. Are there people that used to be on your prayer list and you've given up? Don't give up. Keep praying, brothers and sisters. Uh, God will answer. And this is the picture in heaven, isn't it? The prayers of the saints rising like incense, as if the prayers are visible in the presence of God. And he will answer everyone. Be encouraged, dear Christian. Be encouraged. His delays are not his denials. And God is right on time.